We got some players we need to watch at the combine and a couple of guys still in the GOAT conversation in coaching and quarterbacking. We'll talk about all that in Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is up, good people? Welcome to another Wednesday edition of Locked On NFL, where it's your team every day. We thank you for making us your first listen, reminding you that we're also free on all platforms. Wherever you get your podcast, you'll get us and you ain't got to pay for it. Just that simple. You get us and you ain't got to pay for anything, right? But make sure you go to the YouTube page, Locked On NFL, and hit that subscribe button and then like the shows as well. Got a guest today. My man, James Rapine, is doing combine business. And I'm joined by my brother from another mother. Uh, that's You know, I say that about everybody. So it's like, how many brothers you got, right? But <laughs> Lauren Cox. Y'all know Lauren Cox from Locked On Bears. He joins me here today. We're going to talk about everything from the combine down to a coach and a quarterback. What's up, Lauren? Hey, appreciate you having me on. And yeah, we're all, it's all one big family here. You got a big family of brothers and, and sisters from other mothers on this network. I do have sisters from another mother on this network as well. By the way, um, it, it, y- y'all don't know this, but me and Lauren became uh, acquainted at the uh, Senior Bowl and we were inseparable and we had our cigars and our single malt. Lauren, I don't smoke cigars anymore. And I, I know. can't drink single malt. It's um, like, man, I, I, I was like, I'm going to see his face and I'm going to sit here. I ain't trying to bore y'all, but y'all got to put up with this. I'm going to see his face and I'm going to want to go over there and get me one of those Perdomos over there in that drawer. And I want to get me some single malt. I still got it here for my guests and it's calling me, but I'm doing good because I'm thinking about my health, man. So good. maybe we get together and we can, oh, I don't know, eat some ice cream or something, you know, to <laughs> kind of pass the time. <laughs> right. Something, something I can still do on occasion let's get right to it for our locked on nfl folks and any new listeners we thank you and welcome you in you see if you're looking at youtube you see my set behind me you can pull up and sit in that seat right there and put your feet up on the ottoman because once you're here for five seconds you it's like you've been here for five years so welcome to the locked on nfl we're going to talk about the combine man we were talking about some players that have intrigued us i know i've been doing a little film study and some of the bigger stories that will come out of the combine, you want to bring up a guy from up your way, and I'm glad you brought him up because he's been on my mind too. Yeah, let's start with Peter Skaronsky from North Carolina. Honestly, I'm not positive I've been saying his last name correctly, but it's – He's you know, Northwestern, right? He's, I, I say North Carolina, yeah. Northwest. You did, but here's the thing. And you up in Chicago, we're going to forgive you, but I do that all the time. So, you know, you've been talking already all day, but that's all right. But, yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about. Uh, uh, one of the great – offensive line prospects in this draft but everyone wants to see not only you know how long his arms are to see the the full measurements on his length but also you know how well he moves and kind of drills he gets put through here for the offensive tackle position how well he runs in the 40 is he a guy that teams can trust as a full offensive tackle is he a guy that has to play guard at the next level because he just doesn't have quite enough length or quite the exact mobility skills an NFL team is looking for. Like he can make himself a lot of money because offensive tackles go in the top 10 offensive guards go in the top 20. I mean, with, with exceptions there. And that that's kind of the range that we could be looking at for him. He could be in that like seven, eight, nine, 10 category as a top tackle. Or, or if he's, if he's a guy that might have to play more exclusively guard, then that's more like 17, 18, 19. And there's quite a few million dollars that separate uh, those draft slots. I totally agree with you. That's one thing that I have been wondering about. In fact, to the point where this is almost like a deja vu because I was going to ask you about him for our Jaguars podcast, uh, try to have you on and ask you about it. Um, We still might do that, but I'm always concerned with any quirk about a guy's physical traits, right? Now, the tape will tell you something. What the tape doesn't necessarily tell you is how's he going to respond and react when everybody on that next level is really, really good. And it can be really, really unforgiving in the National Football League, especially if you have a franchise quarterback and you stick this dude out at left tackle and he's losing reps uh, because of things that are out of his control. I think with the things that are in his control, he's going to be just fine. 
uh, you don't get to this point where people are willing to think about overlooking the fact that you're 290 something and has short arms and people are still putting you in this category. That's rarefied air. So that means that you had to play really, really well to get people to look at you. But still, traits don't lie in the National Football League. To have low weight and short arms really bothers me at the tackle position because you can be in all kinds of position with your feet. I just don't, I'm not smart enough to understand how you overcome that stuff. So I have to imagine that this may be one of those players that's a candidate for all of us so-called smart people to keep saying this type of stuff. And he ends up with a playoff team and he plants himself at left tackle for the next 12 years. And he's all everything. And he ends up in a really, really good situation. I think that might happen unless somebody falls in love with him and they stand on the table for him in the top 15 and go, you got to take him. You got to take him. And, you know, there's no shame in him moving inside the guard and being an, a great guard in the NFL. And I think of like Cody Whitehair, now of the Chicago Bears, when they drafted him out of Kansas State. Great left tackle in college, but, you know, they got him in the second round and made him a guard. And I think Skaronsky is better than that, but Whitehair's had a great career and made, you know, $13 million a year on his contract right now. And it's it's not a knock on him as a player or how he's viewed. It's just sometimes your skill set doesn't quite a line at the NFL where you can get away with in college is a little bit different when the edge rushers in, in the national football league, a little bit longer, a little bit bigger, a little bit faster, a little bit stronger, and not quite exactly the same caliber, although he, he played some NFL edge rushers at Northwestern. So, you know, there is some of that tape to look at as the translation to the pros. And here's a, a good segue to the guys I was thinking about people that he has to block. Keon white looks like somebody that was built in a lab. And I know people are like, man, we ain't talking about no workout warriors or this ain't bodybuilding. No, you watch him on tape. I did not know when I was watching him, I was like, he's a pretty big guy. Maybe he's 270 pounds or something. And this dude is 285, 290 pounds at 6'6". Six, six. And I saw him playing stand-up edge rusher. Unbelievable out of Georgia Tech. I sat here and I'm thinking like, the Jaguars need edge, but he doesn't really fit what they need. But I sat here, and you can appreciate this, Lauren. I tried to convince myself that they need to take him if he's on the board or they need to move up for him. And another kid, and you know him better than I do because you saw more Big Ten football, is Lucas Van Ness out of Iowa. He has teammates buzzing about him. He's another 6'5", 269-pound guy. That The Jaguars at 24, may, he may be out of reach for them. But you're going to see a lot of Aiden Hutchinson comparisons to Lucas Van Ness. And he is a fast riser because I didn't even see him in mock drafts in anybody's top 50. And now he's in everybody's top 15. Both of those guys are really intriguing for 4-3 defenses, right? Because you feel like in base, you know, when you have your three linebackers in the field, you put them at end and they're going to be big, strong, and stout against the run. And, of course, still offer a lot of upside on the pass when they're going to be in passing situations. But you go to that nickel formation – and you can kick them inside the three technique defensive tackle, get another edge rusher from your bench and your rotation out there and get more of that like pass rush package with a guy that you feel like has legitimate skill set to play edge and to maybe play that three technique tackle. And not that you got, you're not exactly getting two players in one, but you're getting a player like this can do a lot more in different ways for your defense than your, tradi your traditional like stand up edge rusher who won't necessarily have the bulk or the strength or the power to move inside was still really valuable, but doesn't have the same kind of valuable value in versatility to offer your defense multiple things to get different guys on the field around him. No doubt about that. All right. So make sure you guys tune in to locked on NFL draft because those guys do a great job of actually breaking it down follow that podcast, like, and subscribe. You'll get more in depth information uh, than we just gave you because they do a whole segment. I mean, a whole show all the time on locked on NFL draft, a lot of information coming out of the combine. Something I saw at the combine too. I saw Andy Reed. Andy Reed looks like he has a permanent smile on his face now. And I'll tell you, I don't think it's just because they just recently won the Super Bowl. I'll tell you in segment two is Lauren and I discuss it just a second here on locked on NFL. The Locked On NFL podcast is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook, because FanDuel is making it super easy for new customers to get involved. You can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets right back to you, even if your first bet doesn't win, free money for you to keep playing with 
FanDuel. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And just because we're in the football offseason doesn't mean you can't still be betting on football. I mean, we're talking NFL draft today. You can bet on who's going to be the number one overall pick, who's going to be the first quarterback drafted, the first wide receiver drafted, the first defensive player drafted, and all sorts of other football bets for this upcoming season. The XFL, college football, and all of sports, where whatever you like, FanDuel has fun ways to play for you. So don't miss your chance to get that no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA and NFL. All right, we're rolling along here on Locked On NFL on a Wednesday with my man Lauren Cox joining me, Tony Wiggins. James Rapine is at the Combine. He's running around getting all of his information, doing all of these things, and we ain't want to cut him short. Uh, he might be at that steakhouse. I ain't no telling. You know, every, everybody congregates at that steakhouse the same way that they congregate at Deets down in Mobile. So did you go to Deets this year? Veets with a V, yeah. We, Veets with a V. See, now I'm screwing up words. Veets. You, did was, you go? There was one night when we drank them out of Bud Light bottles and they had to start switching to cans because our table was full of empty. So we, we all, I bet it was all locked on, people, too, just out drinking the entire oh. uh, coaching staffs from various teams around the league. So, Saw a number of coaching staffs around there and picked up some good information, that's for sure. Did you? Well, we saw some last year, too. All right. <laughs> Speaking of coaching and coaching staffs, there's a very happy coaching staff right now uh, in the National Football League is the Kansas City Chiefs. In fact, one of them so happy he went and took another job somewhere else just to prove how good he is in Eric B. Enemy. But I saw Andy Reid on TV doing an interview, and I've actually noticed this about Andy Reid. He was always a jovial, nice, chummy sort of Mr. Belvedere, just want to go give him a hug, you know, uncle type dude, right? He looks happier. And the only other time I can tell you I saw something like this was, well, twice. When LeBron said it's about damn time when he won a trophy in basketball. And I remember before that, and I'm going to date myself because this was about 25, 26 years ago. Actually, it was 28 years ago when the 49ers beat the Chargers and Steve Young goes, woo, he pulled a monkey off his back. I think Andy Reid for a long time was considered the best coach that had never won a championship. Now he's won two. And it puts him in a whole different category. Of, uh, you win a Super Bowl, you're great. Sean Payton, uh, Mike Tomlin, all of that is good. But now he's won multiple. So now he has the hardware to match the reputation and the things that everyone thought about him. Andy Reid looks like he's dropped some weight, has a smile on his face. He's cracking jokes at every turn. Like the, the guy asked him, what did he do? He said, well, I went off to California. I didn't stop working, but it's nice to work while you're looking at the ocean. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. And it's just like, he, could it be that he's the example in coaching of, Never give up. Just, just, I don't want to sound like Jim Vivano, but it, it's what it is. Just never quit, never give up, and whatever's supposed to come to you is going to come to you. Yeah, I mean, he's 64 years old now, and, and it feels like he's finally reached that, 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 that place of Nirvana where, like, the pressure's off. Like, yes, he, he had won a Super Bowl before, but there's something about, like, that was sort of like the expectation, right? If you're going to yes. be this good for this long, and, you know, a team that was perennial contender, like, you have to get – the one you're just expect if you want to be like respected among the really good coaches, you have to have one. You mentioned Sean Payton, you know, Mike McCarthy, guys like that, that are, that are good coaches, but not like great coaches. I mean, even, you know, you, you know, some of the other coaches around the league that just kind of have you know, Sean McVay's got the one, although he's, he's a bit on the younger side there. And like Jim Harbaugh's or John Harbaugh's got the one, like that, that's a nice category to be in. But if you're going to be the Andy Reid who's been around for decades and led multiple teams to multiple championship games, like, one is like, okay, you've met our expectations. You've, you've achieved kind of what you're supposed to achieve. Two is like, okay, like I've, I've, I've done it. You, you got nothing on me now. Like I, I have done it more than once with, with, you know, without Tyree kill the second time without, you know, without some of the same resources, the second time to be able to kind of build it up this way again. Now you got nothing on me. There's no, there's nothing else I need to prove to anybody. Else. I'll still want to get a third Super Bowl, but now he's in that rarefied air. And it's just funny to me that like, you know, that, that Eagles Chiefs game was so 
back and forth. And if one play yeah. goes differently and the Eagles win that game, we, we think differently about Andy Reid, even though it's it's a couple plays in one game. He's still been the three Super Bowls with the Chiefs and he still won all these games. But something about having that actual sit that ring, the actual success there just changes the whole perception and the whole feeling, even though he's been really good for a really long time either way. You, you're right. And, and, and I hope that what people don't do is because I'm always, every time I talk, I always say this person's going to say this, you know, All right, as soon as I say that, I know they're going to say this. I hope no one says, well, yeah, he finally got a, a great quarterback to go to one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And that's going to segue to something we're going to talk about in segment three. It's, it's not that simple. It's really not because this guy named Mike Holmgren that had a great quarterback for a long time. And he won one, but he's always been considered. And he's the perfect example of a guy who his reputation, it seems like because his coaching tree was so big, it seems like he won two or three, but he didn't. He got one. And, you, and you're almost hoping and rooting that a guy like Andy Reid doesn't, and I'm not this, I love Mike Holmgren, but he's almost a forgotten guy. Like if you go up to a 26 year old and ask him about Mike Holmgren, when you, I was 26, you asked me about, Vince Lombardi, I knew exactly who he was. I'm 26. You can ask right. me about Mike Holmgren. Right. You know, <laughs> so what do you you know about Mike Holmgren, right? You're from that that up there. Yeah, growing up around there, I mean, I, I know the Mike Holmgren era a little bit. And I remember, like, it, it, it was kind of a, a disappointment with him and and also with, with Mike McCarthy in Green Bay, too. Like, both of them getting, getting one, and that's great. But it was always like, well, where's the second one? And I think Green Bay fans were – kind of ready to move on from both despite all the winning that they did and all the success they had because you get a little spoiled and feel like well yeah yeah you're you're supposed to get one you have a hall of fame quarterback yeah if you didn't get one it would be a disaster so now you got one where's the second like that's where you take that next level and that's what i think circles back to andy reed and it's funny too that holmgren and reed are both big round white guys with mustaches like i i, I think of them as <laughs> coaches but reed, reed got his second and maybe it's the glasses that make the difference there yeah, so before anybody says that, I'm going to tell you something. If we want to dismiss a coach's accomplishments because he had the GOAT or like an all-time legend on his team, or we have to do it to Belichick, right? Um, we have to do it to John Wooden. We have to do it to Phil Jackson. And unless anybody – you have to do it to Chuck Noll who had – oh, I don't know, 78 Hall of Famers on one damn team and he won four in six years. You can, you just can't do that. You can't dismiss. There's a lot of great players and a lot of great quarterbacks that have not found multiple Super Bowl success at their age. And we're going to talk about one of those dudes in segment three. I still, I, I'm not one that changes very quickly. If you ask me at the beginning of this year, who's the most talented quarterback I've ever seen, I say it's Aaron Rodgers. He's the most talented quarterback I ever saw, and he's one of the three best I've ever seen. I saw a list the other day that put him at number seven, and I think it has a lot to do with stuff that doesn't have anything to do with football. I'm going to discuss that in just a second with you here on Locked on Jaguars. Locked on NFL. <laughs> see? You see that? You see that? You see that? Locked on NFL. All right. Third segment. We're talking about, we just to recap, Andy Reid looking different because he won a multiple championship. Guys in the draft in the first segment that we need to look out for this week as the measurables become so important. But now we're going to talk about a subject, and this is in the wheelhouse of the NFC North, so I'm glad Lauren's here. Lauren, am I crazy to still think that Aaron Rodgers is a top four quarterback and probably still neck and neck with Patrick Mahomes in terms of the most talented quarterback I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I think the key word there, right, is most talented quarterback because obviously you can look at at his exact production in 2022 and see that it was down a little bit. And you can look at him dealing with was it a thumb or a finger injury? It's one of the fingers in his hand injured for a lot of the season, and of course a super young wide receiving core having lost Devonte Adams this season really affecting I think a lot of his ability to produce. Right, he can only control what happens until the ball arrives at wherever he's throwing it to. But at, once the ball gets there, the receiver has to catch it and maybe do something with it after the catch. And of course, the offensive line had a bunch of injuries in Green Bay this season, and he still played at a pretty darn high level for a guy who's what turned 39 in December and can do some really special things 
you know, in, in, as a quarterback that we just don't see guys being able to do. And I think it gets skewed a little bit. We start seeing Patrick Mahomes and some of these and, and Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow, these young guys having a little bit more like energy and excitement. But I think there's a certain subtlety to some of what Aaron Rodgers does that maybe gets lost in that a little bit in terms of how he manipulates the pocket and how he does these like subtle flicks of the wrist to just kind of drop a ball in there and, and find like just absolute perfect timing when it absolutely needs to be there. When it's not, it's not always the 60 yard bomb, but it's, it's the perfect play when you absolutely need it. That is just so rare. And in how consistently he does it, that you just don't see other quarterbacks really holding up at that same level. Yeah. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's the same guy he was three years ago, because obviously he isn't, he's been banged up a little bit and the team around him changes. But the tape I watched was, I think, from two and three years ago, where he dropped balls in to places where I was like, how in the hell did he do that? How? And um, I haven't seen Mahomes. Mahomes guns it in. He throws no-look passes. He throws off schedule. He puts balls where with power where you're not supposed to off the wrong foot. I wouldn't be surprised if someday somebody hit him and neither one of his feet are on the ground and he throws the ball 30 yards, right? And he's great. I didn't say Rodgers was better. I said neck and neck. But in, in football, touch passes matter. And I have never in my life seen anyone throw touch passes like Aaron Rodgers. I'm starting to think that a lot of people are changing their opinion over Aaron Rodgers based on him sitting in a cave somewhere with all the windows closed or the door shut and the curtains I think that and that bad haircut that he has is is what's <laughs> causing people. And the the day to day, I love Pat McAfee. He goes on a Pat McAfee show, and then with the Green Bay people saying, "Oh, we haven't had that discussion yet." And when it, I think people are starting to fire of him, and what that is is they're getting tired of the shenanigans in the off season to the point where they're actually using it to diminish what he did on the field. I, I think it's a reasonable I think it's I think it's a reasonable take like he's he's a guy that I think used to be very likable in the same way that like Green Bay is kind of the likable team you know they're publicly owned and they're up in the frozen tundra and they've got all the history and it's like oh that Green Bay was is almost never the villain except for to other NFC North teams but like comparatively to like you know the Cowboys or the Eagles or the 49ers like those teams are more so the villains of of NFL or then the Packers are kind of like the every man's team thing. And Rogers was kind of that quarterback. And all of a sudden it really started, I think with, with COVID and the vaccine stuff and him kind of hiding the truth about whether or not he was vaccinated and sharing some, some opinions on that, that weren't necessarily super science backed. It, it was all downhill from there. And then he opens up about, you know, going into some of these spiritual journeys. And I, I think there's some unfair discrimination there too. Like he's a guy who's, you know, really in tune with his mental health and a guy who's never had a great relationship with his own family and has been kind of open and vulnerable about that sort of thing. And I, as much as I, I, I don't necessarily agree with going into a dark room for four days and doing the, the ayahuasca trip that he did, like I respect a man trying to find himself and trying to find answers in life. I mean, we're all trying to find ourselves and find answers in life and find what makes us happy and, and get through those things. And it, it kind of adds up with Rogers to build this sort of negative public image of him, but I, I don't know. I, I still, I still have a lot of respect for for him. Certainly as a football player, and I think I respect the journey he's trying to go through off the field, even if it's not maybe the way I would go through that same journey. No doubt about it. We we can't write a script for other people, uh, and the way that they monitor their lives. Somebody always told me something. They said, "Don't fret how a man makes his money, as long as he doesn't come borrowing money from you. Then mm -hmm. that's when you can question him and ask him what he does." Well, but so, I think that's where Packers fans come from. It's like, you know, he got this contract extension to come back from to Green Bay and his salary went way up. And he's supposed to have like this season, like a $50 million cap hit that he's going to try and bring down. And all of a sudden it's not that he's taking Packers fans money, but he is taking more money away from the team and not providing as much on the field. And that's where it starts to sour a little bit, especially if Packer fans feel like, oh, well, if you spent less time in a dark room and do an <laughs> ayahuasca and more time practicing I, I don't know it's not like Rodgers yeah. needs more practice he's 40 years old like he knows the offense but like you know what I mean like is is he doing everything in his power to be the best football player I would argue this spiritual journey can if, he, if it helps his mind and his mental health that does make him a better football player but you know money becomes a factor on that contract at this stage of his career yeah you also can't complain about the team not doing things that they're supposed to do when you give them about this much time to do it when they don't know exactly what it is you're up to so a quick recap watch out for keon white 
see what those measurables look like. The workout on the field, Lucas Van Ness is a fast riser out of Iowa. Peter Skaronski is the undersized offensive tackle that's going to get a lot of looks and consideration. Those are our three guys. You can find out more about those players at Locked On NFL Draft. And every day on Locked On Jaguars and Locked On Bears, you can see the two of us, and we'll have it down for you. Make sure you tune in to Locked On NFL the rest of the week. This is not Locked On Jaguars. This is Locked On NFL. Make sure you tune in the rest of the week. The guys will have good shows for you, and I'm sure more from the combine. For Lauren Cox and Tony Wiggins, we thank you for joining us and making us your first listen. Don't let it be the last time, and make sure you take care of each other.